everyone. We're back again with Book Watchers. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I'm the Adult Programming Coordinator. And with me tonight is the top corner. Hi, I'm Beth. I run the House Calls program, and I'm here to talk about this show and book. <laughs> and below me. Hi, I'm Laura. I do all the teen programming here for the Pickens County Library System. And let's see if I can do the right angle. Diagonal. Diagonal. I'm Erin, and I work in the reference department at Easley. Uh, tonight, we're discussing You by Caroline. Somebody else. Kipnis? I Yeah. I'm, and the TV series that uh, was originally made for Lifetime, but then ended up getting aired on Netflix. Um, so, <laughs> y'all ready to dive in on this? treasure trove of information. Um, if anybody is watching and you have questions or comments or want to put in your two cents, please feel free to um, chime in in the comments and we'll get to any questions or comments you have. Um, discuss the structure of you. What's the effect of hearing about Beck from Joe's point of view? As you get to know Joe better, do you trust his narration? <laughs> why or why not? But I did not write this question. I found this question ludicrous, but I also was like, somebody thought this. No, I don't trust his narration. I'm just going to go no. ahead and <laughs> He's an insane man. <laughs> um, but no, I don't trust anything that he says. Also, like, at what point are you supposed to? Because by, like, the third page in the book, he's like, I'm going to Google you. I'm like, I feel like he's obviously an unreliable narrator because he talks to typewriters. <laughs> he does. His typewriters are named. Um, Larry is his favorite, right? Or whatever. Larry? Hey, Larry. Which is the one that he throws into the wall? Is it Isn't Larry? It? I think so. Yeah. Aaron, I know that we had talked about this and you said that you had like some specific ideas about the book narration and the choice of person. Oh, yeah. Um, mostly I was thinking about, well, the use of second person. I feel like it just objectifies Beck. And uh, like with him being an unreliable narrator, kind of what I think the author is trying to do on a structural level is is like making some kind of statement through Joe about modernism as a like literary movement because he's obsessed with the modernist Joyce Salinger, his typewriters. And that's when we get the unreliable narrators as a big thing. And even though I don't, I don't as far as I'm aware, like second person isn't really a thing in those, it's all stream of consciousness. Yeah. which is what he does anyway. Like yeah. pretty much the entire book is just his stream of consciousness, objectification of Beck and yes. others. And so I feel like that's kind of what she's going for with this type of narration. I'm still on the fence of whether or not it's entirely successful, at least well, for me. It's successfully creepy. And it did yeah. feel like it was, I think that the reason why it bothered me was because my mind says, yep, that's what goes through their heads. It was too identifiable in all of the horror <laughs> and thriller genres that I've seen is that that is what that guy is thinking. And yes. I maybe I never wanted to actually go there to hear <laughs> that inner dialogue and justification. You know? Also, Erin, I thought about what you said and you had talked about how like the second person narration did not work for you. But and I was like, yeah, you're right. Like it didn't work for me either. And I thought like this is a failure on behalf of the author for me because it doesn't work. But then I thought in reality, maybe it's not supposed to work because Joe is a giant failure. And so his internal monologue is in itself a failure. So it is technically second person, but he the um, Joe is not talking to you. The author is talking, using Joe to talk to Beck. Right. So, when you say, yes. so theoretically, we are not the target audience for Joe. But I feel it, like we're, sorry, that works, but that it's supposed to make us identify with Beck and kind of subsume the reader and Beck into a single you. Not necessarily. I, 
necessarily, I don't think. I think it's just supposed to take like another uh, like lens of the common. So like a crime procedural show or anything like that. You always see it from like the cop or you focus in on the victim um, and it's from like an outer perspective. But I think maybe it's just Joe being a creep talking to Beck in his brain. But also he's, and I thought about this and I don't know how you guys will feel. He's unreliable. It's second person, but it's also like vaguely second person omniscient because Joe is a stalker. And so he has all of this information and he is aware of a lot of what is happening. And I feel like that also changes the narrative. Sure. But you have to, the way that he's describing things is through his interpretation of what's happening. Absolutely. So when he sees stuff happening, he's like, oh, well, she's doing this because of this. And this is happening because of this reason. But really, he's just interpreting things the way it is in his head. Yeah, he's interpreting them and then stating them as fact. Right. Right, right. which makes him unreliable. Yeah. Um, when Joe meets Beck, he's instantly smitten. Uh, what were your initial impressions of Beck and did your opinion of her change? And if so, why? So my opinion of Beck varies depending on the medium. So in the book, um, Joe isn't really, he's sort of smitten with Beck, but he keeps comparing her to Natalie Portman, especially in the, um, the movie Closer, which her role in that is like for some reason is a really big um favorite of a lot of men a uh, younger 30-ish you know men um her role in that 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 film and so every time he he describes her he says her portman smile or her so really she's just a stand-in for this we would say Perfect. the manic pixie dream girl um that he's obsessed with and he kind of just like pushes her into this because some of the stuff that she does doesn't necessarily fit with that actual perception um, until he makes it fit. So I don't know if he's actually smitten with Beck or if he's forcing her into this role because she's a lot more quirky in the book um, yeah. than in the show. In the show, she's a little bit more like she picks some of the lines that they gave her in the show actually were Joe's lines in um, or his thoughts in the book so that they have more of a deeper connection in the show than in the book. The book is just him like obsessing over her. And then in the, but the TV show makes it look like they have a lot in common actually. And that actually bothered me immensely <laughs> that there was so much of, that was his inner monologue that was acted as out as if it was her. Right. Like, I noticed, too, he specifically talks about Natalie Portman, not just all Natalie Portmans, but Natalie Portman in Closer. And that's really interesting because she's an exotic dancer in Closer. So that's a performative career. And Joe obviously has some insecurities about like gender performance and his own performance of masculinity and Beck's gender performance and like performance in general because there's a lot of Beck's issues stemming from that and so I feel like Laura you're right um that he's not really smitten with her so much as the idea of her and there's this overarching idea in the whole book of like everything about your life is performative have any of you guys watched closer before I have not <laughs> You have, Beth? No. Have you watched Closer? You have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have time. Okay. So that's mostly like, I think that's also she does, Natalie Portman dies at the end. And that's in the book. That's so. Foreshadowing? You know. <laughs> um, oh, spoiler alert. <laughs> um. Joe is self-conscious about his educational and personal background. How does it affect his narrative? Well, he's the worst. So, <laughs> so there's that. 
he's deeply insecure. And I think that he um, attempts to mask that with this sort of I'm the smartest person in the room. He's also like very obviously a narcissist. So, yeah, he's also obsessed with a lot of like modernist classics. Mm -hmm. Like not like I, like, I mean, you can only reference so many books in a book or a show and it not be tedious. But the, all of the ones that he does reference as loving um, are, you know, Joyce and Salinger are very, like, are taught in schools and, like, high school, all grades. And then, and then he disparages a lot of contemporary fiction and contemporary authors that have not necessarily made the rounds into, you know, the academy. So Especially... You know? Contemporary authors of color yeah. or um, women. women. He he very much is like, forget you, Edwidge Danticott. And I'm like, Joe, if you don't shut your mouth. <laughs> What's real Which funny, is what I thought was funny in the book, um, because you know, it's like a big joke. I don't I don't know if you guys, um, there's like a big joke that's like, if, if you meet a guy and he says his favorite book is Catcher in the Rye, you should always run. Get out. That's, Get uh, out. that's like the biggest joke. And that's like usually the common like cis het white male sort of book, favorite book because they're like, oh, I'm just like. Um, Holden so, Caulfield. Yeah. And so in the book, he specifically says, I chose like I chose to my favorite book to not be Catcher in the Rye. Because he's like aware of that sort of mm -hmm. like it's a playoff of that sort of joke. Maybe the author, because of course the author is female, um, maybe she's playing off that joke where he is like, I know that a lot of guys choose Catcher in the Rye, but I'm not going to because I'm making that choice. And I'm kind of like, and there is the whole thing with Dan Brown and how he ends up reading that Dan Brown. And even though he is like viciously insulted all of these people who enjoy this Dan Brown book, right. he refers to reading that Dan Brown book as like the most romantic moment of his life. And he loves it. And again, that goes back to the idea of like everything about Joe is performative because he doesn't even really love these books he loves. And he does love that Dan Brown. Well, the pro I think what it, what it comes down to in the books is that is the only time that you actually see Joe and Beck engaging in literature together. Because in the book, Beck is a lot less studious um, than in the show. So she actually doesn't do a lot of writing and she doesn't do a lot of like talking about books or anything like that. Even the book she chooses in the um, store in the book is a lot different than what she chooses in the show. In the show, it makes it look like she's more um, of a prolific reader to all of uh, these authors who are not as known um but in the book it's not so so really in the book when they read the da vinci code together that's literally joe says the it's the most romantic time because that is the only time that they even engage together in like about literature even which though is, she's a writer and he's a bookseller which is interesting when you think about benji and him trying to educate him in the basement, making him <laughs> Joyce and Salinger, which like being locked in a basement, being forced to read James Joyce is also my nightmare. So I can't really fault Benji. And it's just so, it's it's odd how- but Technically he only makes him read them because he said he read them. Yeah. So Okay, just like he only makes him drink that club soda because he made it, but like I don't want to be locked in a basement drinking only club soda. No, thank well, you. Yes, but I'm just saying that. But it was a it, test. It, it was to see if he could actually his super awesome club soda. Right. But he even <laughs> tasted it. What there he is with his awesome club soda. It's all about being fake, you know, and that's kind of what Joe is obsessed with, which is I find ironic because Beth yes. herself has a very, very large, like she is very big on being fake, like to her social media, the fact that she's a writer, but she never talks about writing in the book. You hardly see her write. And she's more concerned with like um, going out and getting like, social media famous and stuff like that so joe is very obsessed with fakeness even though beck herself but but i mean joe's fake too so yeah oh yeah, um, yeah. yes um, absolutely <laughs> but um joe feels that he that benji is a better person because his time in the cage 
Throughout the book, Joe speaks well of his own time imprisoned in the cage, discuss incar inc incarceration in storytelling. Did you ever hope that Joe would let Benji or Buck go? It's and not so much hope. I was just like, he not gonna. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's not that's gonna happen. Said. That's exactly as what soon, I said. As soon as the cage was mentioned, I was like, she's going in that cage. She's yes. There's no other way this can end. Aaron texted me and was like, one, she's going in the cage. Two, she's dead. This is done. <laughs> um, I think what's really funny is like in the book, um, Joe really like thinks back fondly on his time in the cage because he's like, I learned stuff and he taught me these things and it was good for me. But in the show, he's like, Mr. Mooney is crazy. And he locked right. me in there and it was awful. So, you know. Yeah, no, in the book, he... He doesn't say anything bad about Mr. Mooney. He's like, Mr. Mooney was a solid dude. He did me a good thing. He put me in there. I learned about James Joyce. He's like, I had a weird time out and it was fine in this cage. I feel like that was an odd choice for them to change because that is the core of who he is, that cage time is good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? because and it's like so supposed to be aware of what is psychopathy you know like um in the book he's unaware that that is technically like abuse and that right. is leaning toward like a psychopathic sort of behavior but in so that makes his behavior as someone who would stalk and kill people more like believable we're in the show they make him aware that it is like abusive because I think they want him to be more palatable in the show like they, they absolutely really did they absolutely they really did, did. I think that's part of why I think that's part of why they gave so much of his monologuing to Beck to kind of spread that out and a give her depth that we can't see in the book because it's his perspective, and then also kind of break it up because so it's not him saying all of these things. It's definitely I felt like reading this book constantly being in his perspective and being immersed in like his psychopathy and his misogyny was so much and that was one of the reasons it took me so long to read the book was because i was like i just can't take it anymore did i want benji and beck to be let go from the cage i don't know they all suck joe sucks beck sucks benji sucks they all suck so i'm kind of like <laughs> <laughs> did anybody like, like i that. just don't feel like joe's murders are that well covered up and i'm kind of like i don't think they are at all I'm like, one, Joe, you're going to get caught. And two, you're not that interesting. And then he didn't get caught. And you're kind of like, yeah. Like, I mean, it's vaguely like a um, um, Dahmer situation or like a Ted Bundy situation where literally they're on, they just finished like killing somebody or the police has them. And then they're like, oh, you're a vaguely Listen. white man. Be free, go. Listen, anybody who's watching this, if you've read the second book and you know if Joe is going to get caught, I'm not going to, and I need you to tell me. I need to know. <laughs> so just drop that in the comments because I'm I, I, done engaging in this series. <laughs> and I would like to know because, like, if because since there's so much that's different from the show to the seer to the book, I want to know if the second book <laughs> is even further from what the books actually were too. Right. Because, you know. Yeah, I have so. no clue. I've watched the second season a couple of times, um, but I haven't read the second a book. A couple of times? Yeah. I wow. Have, I, have, I liked the show. I thought it was really good. Um, our first round of the library being closed um, for us staying home and working from home. Um, it had just come out the second yes, season. Yes, I binge watched all of it. Um, because I was like, I got some time, so I'm going to binge watch some Netflix um, after I'm done for the day. You know, so like, I watched it a few times because I really like crime. I like crime and murder stuff, okay? I do, too. I don't, I, but I don't think Joe is interesting enough to carry me through it. I agree. I, Joe is I, basic. I don't like him in the show. Like, as in, I like following the story and I do think that it's more interesting in the show the book literally he is so creepy like they don't even try to make him like palatable it's literally like 
I'll, I'm always joking with Beth that like literally if in the book he just looked like Dwight Schrute, people would be like because the he's got that personality. They did say in the book that he was cute. They, I mean, they said he was somewhat attractive. Yeah, because if he wasn't cute, none of this would be happening. No. But and, <laughs> yeah. But how could you not find it creepy when he shows up at a Charles Dickens festival you know, four towns away and says he just happened to be there? Well, in the book, she doesn't. In the book, she yeah. doesn't see him. But in the right, show, but in she, the show she did. And so, like, yeah, he's super creepy in the show too because y'all heard of his. his Somebody dropped into the that, comments that Joe does end up in jail at the end of the second book. Oh, that's that, not what happens at the end of um, the second season of the TV show. Ah, uh, see, DV is that not what happens? No, at the end of the second season, he does not end up in jail. Um, quite the opposite. <sighs> Really, the only person that I liked, and I use that term extremely loosely in this book, is Peach. Peach. Yeah. No. I like Peach. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she is. She's like she's a little no, wealthy a and terrible. She's a toxic person. And I, yes. I guess I've had toxic people in my life. And so, no, I do not. I mean, yes, yeah, she's been, all whatsoever. she's very toxic, but she's also deeply closeted. And I guess I just feel a little bad for her. Well, I feel, bad. Was I felt bad for her for that. But I liked the other two friends. They, <laughs> I, I, I didn't even friends. remember the other two friends until you just said that. The two other two friends are better in the show than they are in the book. Also, Peach is a lot more aware in the show. In the book, she's just kind of just a mentally ill somewhat clear of some sort girl um but and she does not think joe is sus at all you know she's kind of just wrapped up in her obviously has had to deal with a bunch of crap as a rich kid growing up in a famous ish family um so i feel like she's a little bit more uh i feel more sorry for her in the book um than in the show in the show she's just actively kind of terrible but I kind of respect the, it because I hate Joe and she hates Joe. Yeah, but in the show, I'm like, you're right. So I like you. Well, also, I mean, if the choices are Joe or Peach. I mean, definitely. <laughs> I think we all know the answer here. I don't know. Peach also treats Beck like crap. She really does. But also, Beck treats Peach like crap. No, also. Well, only Because in the book, she is like... I only like Peach because Peach loves me and I love to be loved. But that's, that's not real. It doesn't, it, her actions don't mm -hmm. say that's the case. She really does do anything and everything that Peach wants her to do. It's only when she's pushed way too far that she finally bites back or starts ignoring Peach. That's true. But then Peach comes up with a, you know, something terrible that's happened to her or, you know, uh, to get her back. And she always does come back. That's true. You got me there. Insert that screen grab from Catfish. <laughs> you got me there. So maybe. Okay, I'm, not, I'm not that quick on my uh, screen grabs. Um, uh, okay. Even though, let's see, where am I? Um, <laughs> Joe and Karen Mitney. Um, he finally hooked up with somebody based on the cat or the mouse in the house. I love Karen Minty. And he got himself a cat. Um, but do you think Joe would have been better off trying to make it work with Karen? No, Karen didn't better off that. working with Joe. He doesn't deserve anybody. No, Karen was too good for him. He Karen sucks. is probably the best person in the book. Yeah, I love Karen. <laughs> I mean, the book and the movie. I yeah, mean, for sure. The, <laughs> she was. Did you say you think Nikki is the best person in the book? Karen no. Minty. Minty. Who? Karen Minty. Oh, okay. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, who's Nikki? Which one was that? The girlfriend. The girl that he dated while he was seeing the shrink. Yeah. Yes, Karen Minty. Yes. Um, Poor Karen Minty, but also good for her. She didn't end up dead. She dodged a bullet. She didn't. 
She really, really did. I don't, I, think, I don't think that he would have killed her because I don't think he would have had that level of obsession with her because she doesn't fit. Enough. She, yeah, she doesn't fit into his box, like his little Natalie Portman and it pixie dream girl box. Um, so I don't think he would have actually put like been pushed to the point of actually killing her because he just didn't obsess over her. She way. doesn't have the manic pixie dream girl energy unless she found out right. what he was or, doing then he would kill her in a second or try yeah I, try to prevent him from being with Beck. i will say one thing that i wish the author had devoted a little bit more time to was when joe goes in to see dr nikki he automatically says that he has obsessive compulsive disorder and there's very little discussion or like actual like they don't actually talk about it or what it looks like or how it presents for joe and joe is just like i know all about it because i've read about it on the internet <laughs> and i i kind of wish that the author would have worked a little harder to give like joe's perception of ocd and how he presents it to his therapist versus like what it actually is or any of that research legwork and i was a little disappointed that she didn't yep. try but maybe that's because joe would have tried Okay, so the thing is, actually, I thought about this, and it is because Joe doesn't try. He purposefully pretends that he, or he says that he has OCD because he needs a reason to see Dr. Nikki, but he doesn't want to actually have a mental illness because he's so narcissistic. He can't even think of the thought of even anybody, even if he's pretending, thinking he is mentally ill or has OCD or something like that. So he doesn't even actually try to do it because he's like, I don't want people to actually think I have this. That's um, fair. Because he's just so narcissistic. That's fair. But I was like, this was a good opportunity, and I felt that it was wasted. Also, listen, I have to say it. I can't get through this whole thing. You cannot cremate a body <laughs> in the woods in one day. That's <laughs> not how cremation works, Joe. I hate to break it to you. Well, it just I, wouldn't work. <laughs> I didn't think it was really even explained in the book. The book, he just said, I cremated him. Yeah, he's like, well, I threw his corpse on a bonfire and it worked. And I'm like, mm -mm. no. And for the <laughs> show, I'm sorry, a body burning does not smell the same also, as a bonfire. So also, people who are like, no, have fun. <laughs> when she's like, he's like, oh, well, I put his ashes and small pieces of bone fragment in a box. I'm like, Joe, you got a box big enough for a human femur? Because it's not going to break down. Well, if he if he got it hot enough and then he hit it with a hammer and crushed it into powder. That's maybe. true. But even in, even in the that's modern. What you do, that's what you do in like older crematoriums. Like the bones didn't break down all the way. So they would just take a hammer and they would. But a lot of the times they have that thing and they put them in there and they like, yeah, it's like a bone blender basically. So he yeah. would have like a lot of larger bones, including because, a skull. Yeah, because like old crematoriums, I think from like the seventies and earlier, they couldn't um, completely disintegrate bone. We now we have better crematoriums, um, and they can right. They you can they can't fully get rid of all the bones. But it's like more but, fine. It's not like a But they can put them pieces. into a machine to make it really fine. Yeah. Even the fragments that they can't that I don't get that. burned all the way down. I learned but that on did, six feet under. It did seem like I, in my mind it was a bigger box. <laughs> Cuz I mean he's taking it to IKEA. Really? I didn't I was like was I don't like, think I, this I'm taking a return to IKEA. Like I don't I didn't picture like a huge box, but mostly I was like Listen, Joe, like I know you Googled how to cremate somebody and buddy, this ain't it. <laughs> well, I just don't. Well, no, he didn't. He, but he, wait a second. He did say in the books that he Googled In the it, book, he, he's like, I Googled it. But in the I Googled show, it. Specifically yeah. He said he looked at books. He yeah, said, he looked it up in the books. Yeah. In the book, he says he Googled it and that he and like burns the body in the woods for 24 hours. And I'm like, yeah. No. So anybody who thinks that would work, no, <laughs> probably not. So if you kill someone, get rid of them in a different way because that's not going to work. Um, Joe interacts with the police on two separate <laughs> occasions, but he's never arrested or charged. 
How does it feel to read a book with so much crime and so little punishment? Apparently for even a whole nother season in the show. Yes. It did be I like mean, people get, away with, people get away with crimes all the time. Yeah. So. Well, literally, this is just like, people are like, how can you get away with this stuff? And I'm like, think how long Jeffrey Dahmer went on his rampage or how long Ted Bundy, Ted Bundy literally escaped from prison for 30 days. Like, I was like, not this surprising. is like literally the no, same exact stuff. I was like, this makes absolute sense. Yes, yeah, yeah, I like this. Oh, yeah, this absolutely. There um, are a lot of factors that I feel would have affected Joe. And he would have gotten arrested sooner, but none of them are at play in this book. So. <laughs> um, uh, readers and reviewers have said that reading you changes the way you think about talking to strangers and sharing information online. Did you change your passwords? Do you feel more um, wary of strangers on and offline? Well, first of all, I'm a millennial. So my parents were like, don't give your information to strangers on the internet my entire life. Um, they can try to get to me through my seven proxies. But I do think <laughs> what this really what this really taught me was do not give your debit card to any man ever. Because he will use your name to look you up on the internet. <laughs> For me, I I would say like internet stranger danger, don't do that has been my ingrained in me my entire life. So I was like, I'm already doing these things. But also, I don't have a Facebook. So even if you Googled my name on a debit card, I don't know what you're going to find. You are Amy Adam. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's also like how he meets her is in real life. And I feel like women, for the most part, have to have this almost like sixth sense when it when you're out and you're near men. You're always like, because you grow up with your moms and your parents being like, Walk with your keys in between your hands in case yes. you need to stab a guy. You know, it's all don't walk at night. Make sure you're with friends. Or like call somebody. when you're walking to your car, call your friend because that way no one will kidnap you because someone will know. So I think that it did not affect the way that I you already did it because I, I done been new. <laughs> Can't make me more afraid. I'm very so also. Afraid. We yeah. have Vic who leaves her windows open on purpose. Okay, but that goes back to. Beck's desire to perform. Yeah, she I'm wants just... to be seen. She's voyeuristic, an exhibitionist. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, yeah exhibitionist. Yes. Yeah. Maybe both. Probably. Um, do you think it would have been harder for Joe to follow Beck in a smaller town? No. Probably. <laughs> well, I, I think he would have more opportunity to engage with her. Because you're, you're going to be at the same places more. Like, it's reasonable to see someone at Walmart 10 times. Like, that's a that good point. Well, I think that some of the, the reason why he can get away with a lot of this stuff is because he is, he can easily get lost in the crowd. Or, like, when you're in places like New York, um, especially if you live there, the thing is, you don't really, like, you don't look at people. You do your thing. When you're on the subway, you are looking at your own stuff. You're looking on your phone. When you're walking, you don't look at people. You don't engage with them. You don't hold the door open for them. I grew up in Liberty, um, so and it, which is very small. And like you knew everyone. And if you saw them, you knew them. You knew where you saw them. You know, I saw so-and-so at the CVS. I saw them walking down this road. You know, it's kind of like you just know everyone. And you know, like, you're like, well, that's weird that, I saw so and so doing this, but in New York, no one ever pays attention to what anybody else is doing because you keep to yourself and you keep to your own business. So kind of I will like say difference in sizes because Greenville. I grew up in Greenville. It's not a small town, but it's not a big town. But I, I, I will say, I drove by people's houses. I, I mean, will that's say, what I did as a hobby in high school. So with someone. <laughs> With someone like Joe, I feel like you're like, if he were in a small town, he would at some point garner a reputation for being a creep. Yes. Yeah. Like, I feel Me. like somebody would be like, don't mess with Joe. He's insane. Also, and you, knew, would you knew everyone that's your age. And yeah. people, you, and putting on a ball cap wouldn't have changed anything. Like, in my, so from Liberty, I think I had like maybe 100 kids in my graduating senior class, maybe. 
so we knew all of it. We all came, went to kindergarten together. We all graduated high school together. I knew we knew everyone. So she, it's a, it would be very difficult in a small town when everyone knows each other, like to even be able to like creep around like that and just be up to my ball cap. Like, but I feel like in my, for my experience, like, people also make excuses for people they've known a long time. Like I know a lot of creeps and people being like, oh, don't worry about him. He's just like that. He's harmless. And like, no. So I think Joe might have to change how he does it, but I feel like it's not a stretch. Uh, Sharva says, does Joe's inherent privilege play into him getting away with so much? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. There is a reason most killers are white men in their 40s. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why that, that cop who, when he crashed his car, why the cop didn't just take him in, like, right then and there for, like, drunk driving or just to be sure. And I think we also can't ignore that when that happens, he's wearing that boy's hat. So not only is he like, oh, this young, upstanding white man, he's also like, he's wealthy. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Because he's, he's, because he's a white man, um, he can blend in with privilege and wealth a lot easier than someone who is of color because people would be like, do the, they would be like, really? We found really? you in a shed. He also, yes. has, he also has the space to do these things, like that cage basement. Like, even though he's not wealthy, he did inherit the store and that real estate and was able to use that to hide so much. Stuff. I didn't actually think about the value of real estate in a city like New York, Erin. That's a really good point. Technically, yeah, technically, in neither own. the book or the show, he did not inherit the... He just runs them. He just well, he runs, runs them. them. But I mean, he, basically, he assumes that he will inherit them. Yeah. I don't necessarily know if so. that's true. I mean, he but does I mean, consider himself like... like his son. Yeah, yeah. He's but gay. he's also, like, also Mr. Mooney had, he had a stroke. He's not doing... He can't do anything. He's Joe is technically, I mean, not maybe not legally, but is kind of acting as like, what's it called when when you're like power of attorney? The executive. He's, but in Mr. The book, Mooney, he's running he the yet. thing. What? In the book, he hasn't had a stroke. No, in they the book, he's just that. retired. I'm he's just like old. Yeah, I mostly remember, I mostly watched the show. So I that's think why I'm basing the, most of this on. I think the relationship between Joe and Mr. Mooney is just bizarre. And I really. I don't feel like the book actually delves into it enough yeah, for me to feel sorry for Joe at all. I don't because I've read a lot of Dickens novels. <laughs> Literally, no, the Joe, Mr. Mooney, yeah. um, the way that they interact and their relationship is literally classic Dickens. It's great expectations. It's all over twist. You have a young male who gets taken in or, you know, taken, gone under the wing of like a rich Guys. Laura, that is an excellent point because if you'll refer to our previous discussion about A Christmas Carol, I referred to Charles Dickens as known sexist Charles Dickens. And so that also, fits into He was this also book. a known domestic abuser. <laughs> His own dad domestically abused him and he too became a domestic abuser. Abuse That's is why cyclical. a lot of the people okay. in these books are garbage. And one of the other huge differences that I had a problem with between the two was this whole Paco character yes. yeah <laughs> i mean it's so completely different that we have the neighbor that he's mentor it's like they're trying it's like the show was trying to make him seem like he was a good person yes overall because and, in the book he's felt, so heinous there's no way you can lie there, there's him, no, oh yeah no way. but but in but in the show it's like oh he's taking care of paco and yes and um, and, you know, and messes it up real bad yeah he messes that. Yeah, he up. does. He like so really... again. The cycle of abuse is playing out from Mooney it's... and his and Joe to Paco. Well, I think that in the show, to make, they want to give him some sort of like sex appeal because they want people to watch it and they kind of want people to root for him a little bit too. Um, so that's why they make him a lot less creepy, a lot less overtly weird. Um, in his, if you notice the his narration in his head in the show he's a lot more eloquent than he is um in the book in the book he's really crude a lot um but they don't give him that in the show because they want he want they want him to be palatable and it people are like i wouldn't believe that beck like someone like beck would be interested in him 
like this if they didn't give like the viewer a reason to think there's something good about him. And I guess that was Paco. But the thing of it is, is you know what? They didn't give Benji anything palatable and people totally would believe that she liked a Benji. Yes, but <laughs> you know like, we only it, see Benji through Joe's gaze. And so everything we know about Benji well, no. is things that Joe hates. Well, we actually kind of see it through all of her friends. Because I guess all that's of her true. friends are like, I mean, because he's reading their text messages. And so basically they're all saying, he is no good for you. Okay. He's a terrible person. But Joe, like Joe is like really creepy. And oh, he, he is. And yeah, but Benji is seen as very wealthy. And some of the stuff that's, that yep. he does is just what wealthy, White popular, man, yes, attractive yes. men do. So mm -hmm. he is not faulted for it as much and benji also but, got away with crime yeah he did well, I know. Yeah. so i am curious for everyone about what they felt was the creepiest joe moment which one was the one that you were like uh-uh i can't handle it it's too much i don't remember there was it was just all placed oh. together i uh, okay <laughs> One of the things that I found so ludicrous, what, and it was different in the books versus the movie, was him coming home. Because the way Beck found out about him and all this yes! stuff was that it, through basically it wasn't his stuff was hidden in a wall, you know, in the ceiling. It was hidden in the wall in a hole. <laughs> and the fact that he was like, I don't know why you're thinking this is weird. You went into my wall. <laughs> you. He yeah, okay. my so without this talking. one was mine too. This whole scene in the book when he's like, I can't believe you're mad. I stole your underwear when you put your arm in my wall. And I'm like, Joe, really? I, like, know, I think, I think such the a way, weird thought process. And like, I think it was what, such a weird sentence to say. Like, you went in my wall without even asking me. I think one of the worst things about Joe is how he talks about Beck sexually. Like when he yeah. watches her when um, she's intimate with others or she is yes. privately intimate, the way that he talks about it and describes it is just. So Joe is a sexual painful. predator. And it's oh, yes. And it's just awful to have. I like that's not my least favorite thing to read uh, from. I was just like, oh, uh, I also can't stand, and this is just like, it's not creepy, but when Joe is like, I'm so smart, and every person in this room loves to listen to me talk, and I'm so great and wonderful and hot, yeah. and I'm like, Joe, please shut up. <laughs> like, I can't do it. And this. like, when, <laughs> when they're always like, how, talking, there was like a part where they were talking about Joe's typewriters. And how old they are, and how much he loves old things, and he puts these old books back together again. And I'm like, the modernists are not that old. Okay, so my favorite thing is in the book, he's nasty. Like his his apartment is yes. disgusting. He has like a pile of old <laughs> typewriters. Gross. He's disgusting, absolutely heinous, <laughs> awful. But in the show, he's got like this really nice kind of you know kitschy little uh, studio apartment. apartment. Like it was, yeah. it was so cute. He's very also, I'm like, she goes into his dirty old apartment with a hole in the wall and a police tape shower curtain. And she's like, boy, I can't wait to go back. And I'm just like, Don't her like feet stick to the floor? Yes. I'm just like, yes. <laughs> Which like, I'm a slob, but like, not like that. Okay, Joe. Maybe once in a while, but I know it's time to clean. Yes. I mean, I guess if you like somebody enough, I mean, I feel like I'm not the cleanest person and my significant other still wants to visit my house. I don't know. You don't have like a hole in your wall and a bunch of dirty old typewriters. And maybe you do have a bunch of dirty old typewriters, but I you do don't not. have a hole. You've been to my I house have a and hole. you know this. So you know what? Maybe I'm Joe. Well, it don't go happen. into her wall, Laura. I covered it up, though, and there's nothing in there. Well, but that's what she found. She took the tapestry down, and she found the hole. She dug in the hole. Uh <laughs> <laughs> oh, Joe. Stay out of um, the holes is what you get from this book. No holes. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. 
Okay, what did y'all think? Uh, uh, I think we kind of touched on this happy earlier. Valentine's Day. Um, what'd you say? I said, Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the effect of um, it only being Joe's point of view in the book, y'all said that we, we did actually already talk about that. But the we series did. did add her point of view. Why do y'all think it did? Because it also made her stand up to her professor that was not in the book. Like she, because nobody, nobody is going to watch a show that's just Joe talking. Like, no one. I like almost, they, didn't, they didn't have her point of view until far in. It that's true. It, wasn't it was until, the Dickens yeah. episode. Yeah. But they do soften the dialogue. They did. Oh, my gosh, Laura, I just remembered you pointed out Dickens, and they go to that Dickens festival. Yes. That's why. That's why. I'm, that's why I said that it's. There we go. You know, Joe just made that Mooney. connection. I'm Joe done. Mr. Mooney is very much like a Dickinson Dickinson novel, like yeah. he's literally play, like living it out. Based on how much y'all love Dickens, I'm sure you're going to that festival later. Obviously, yes. I'll go to anything that I can wear a costume to. Listen, so. do like costume. at this point, I'm so desperate to leave my house. I would definitely go to that Charles Dickens <laughs> festival. <laughs> If it was like go to a Charles Dickens festival and Rona's over and that's but that's where you get to go, I'm like I will take it. I will go. I will wear a costume. It's I'll fun. eat a turkey leg. I want to be Miss Haversham. Yes, thank you. I would rather wear that suit than that dress. In the show, Beck is like I'm gonna find the skankiest outfit that I can find, but in the book, she just wears like a red a costume. velvet costume that. Well, the dad got the costume. Yeah. He just also, paid like the, the rental was, car. I mean, she lied about her dad being dead, and that was definitely like too much. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. We have a question. Do you find it problematic that they made Joe more palatable in the show, knowing that it would likely reach a wider audience in the book? Does it change the book's message? I feel like. It did bother me a little bit that Joe is more palatable in the show. Like, I feel like, let this man be a creep. This is not like a Ted Bundy, Zac Efron situation. And I don't want it to be. For me, I thought Joe was just also extremely, extremely terrible in the show. I didn't find him palatable, like, at all. I mean, he's definitely, I feel like they tried. I don't feel like they succeeded for me. I think but he's I significantly better in the show than he is in the book, especially because I so I watched the show first, watched the first and second season of the show first. Then I read the book for this and then rewatched it. Um, and I when I was reading the book, I guess because I'd watched the show first, I was like, Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say a co-worker who works here with us talked to me about this book and about the show and discussed that Joe is not in the show a very good stalker. He just like wears a hat and he's like, no one will recognize me in my hat and I can break into your house. And so like that also doesn't work very well. And I feel like Joe is also not very successful in the book and yet he still gets away with it. movie approach. And yes. You, see you, you wear a hat. And then no one knows who. No you one are. will know. Well, no. And also, knows. as Laura, and when you reach a wider audience, somewhere out there is maybe someone who's like, "Well, if I just wear a hat, I can break into someone's house." Also, as Laura pointed out, in New York, they're not looking that close at passersby. So, if you change up your hat, but yes. also people be doing weird stuff all the time, and you just don't want to make eye contact. I'm just going to put that out there. Yeah. Have I, I seen have somebody been on the peeing subway. on the subway in New York? Yes, I have. Did I do anything about it? No, I just averted my eyes <laughs> and just moved on with my life because what am I, what are you going to do? Yeah. No, you're right. I've seen people doing weird stuff here locally and I just, oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like working at the, working at a Funny library, out, you're going to see weird stuff. Imagine all the people you miss doing weird oh. stuff because they were wearing a hat. That's true. <laughs> Or camouflage. Oh. <laughs> well, any other thoughts, last minute ideas? Um, is any uh, Laura has watched both seasons. Anybody else going to read the second book or watch the second season? 
<laughs> also, I did hear, I heard the second book is not as good as the first book. So Netflix keeps kept recommending me the second season, being like, since you finished, you should watch this. And I just like, I had okay, to delete okay. it. I will tell you, I'm interested in reading the second book just to see what's what happens. The second season is pretty good. I mean, it's not bad. Um, Knowing I, that Joe ends up in jail makes me more likely to read it. Okay, but in, in the show is good, though. And it's got, um, what's her face, that played Nell in um, The Haunting of Hill House. The oh, show. Yeah. Ooh. There's a lot of really cool twists. Okay, so the thing, the best thing about the second season is that it's not just the Joe show because there are other characters who are a lot more, because it's L.A. and people are more. Um, oh, you're in L.A.? Yes. So in the second season, he goes to L.A. because he thinks it's a big city like New York. I can blend in really well. But what he doesn't think, what he doesn't think about is that he has surrounded himself with uh, people who are actually like have okay so he's not with like rich people anymore when he moves to LA he has to kind of slum it because he doesn't have a lot of money so he's he ends up like living around a lot of people who actually like pay attention to their surroundings and things like that so that adds a curveball um but also there's a lot of twists uh twists and turns in the second season which I liked a lot better because like the first season is more like will he get caught what will happen? And the second season has a lot more curveballs thrown at you. I never I thought he would get caught. So maybe that was yeah. it. Maybe maybe I found this underwhelming because the stakes were too low and I felt like there was no plot. Well, my guess is if I start a series, most of the time I finish a series. So my my guess is that I will read the second one. And I, my sis, I watched the show with my sister, and she liked it. So she's 100% going to watch the <laughs> I just want to say, I just want to say, your number 16th question. Um, oh. Do you ever feel sorry for Joe? <laughs> why or why not? And my answer is no. I hate him. I hate him the entire time. He is garbage, and I hate him. <laughs> I also, I feel nothing for Joe. I think he's trash. I feel hate. Well, some of the questions were the publishers' questions, what they suggested, the discussion, and that was one of them. And like, and one of the questions was, he sometimes do, does bad things. And I was like, sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> well, I feel like that also might be a marketing thing because I feel like I've seen marketing for the book, the show at least, where they're like romantic thriller. And I was right? like, mm. like <laughs> if anybody likes Joe, I would like to hear about that. Yes, please. Uh, please tell us. I'm I want open. to know. I want to know. I want to have a very intelligent and open discussion about Joe. Okay, don't roll up in here being like, Pin Badgley is hot. No, I don't want that. <laughs> what I want is the case. textual evidence. I want you to talk about Joe, especially book Joe, but you know, like who he is as a character. But I will say overall, this is. Uh, it's an easy book to discuss <laughs> and show to discuss because there was so much that like you're going to have an extreme reaction to it. Yeah, No, I agree. Yeah. This was really yeah. fun. I hope all of you have enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed hating it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time. On have the day. Any of you Joe stands. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, y'all.